Okay, in this lecture, we'll focus on task one. So it transforms uh, partition function, and now it's in three manifold. So for this moment, I want to invite you to forget about 4D for a moment, and we, we will only focus on 3D in this lecture. And also give you an alert, and the content I'm going to introduce to you might not be very familiar to people in the LQG community, so I will try to uh, go slow. And um, it's hard to deliver the full, the full detail, so, but I will try to deliver the, the idea. And some details I will refer to the lecture note, which you can find from the website. So let's get started. And the first thing we discussed is the transcendence partition function on an ideal titration. And what is the ideal tetrahedron? Let me first give you a definition. An ideal tetrahedron, I will denote it by a tri triangle, and it's a, tri it's a tetrahedron whose vertices are located at infinity. Are at infinity. And so we, to represent it, I would uh, represent it by some vertex truncated uh, I, I would represent by truncating uh, vertices. So at the beginning, I will have I have a tetrahedron like this. To re represent that they are at infinity, I would just truncate the vertices. So I will get something like this. I will become a triangle. This is a triangle. And these are the truncated vertices. So you can just understand the ideal tetrahedron as some vertex truncated tetrahedron. Okay? And on the boundary uh, of this uh, ideal tetrahedron, there, there are two kinds of boundary. And the first kind is the original boundary. Now it becomes a hexagon, for example, this one. And we classify it as the geodesic boundary. Just a name. And the second kind is created by removing the vertices. And for example, this one is triangle created. And this kind of boundary, we call it a cusp boundary. And we do this because we want to use a technique called ideal triangulation. And it's a, it's a Weight of discretization, triangulation, is a way to discretize a three manifold, a graph complement three manifold. And what is ideal triangulation? It's basically that if I can uh, decompose it into a collection of several ideal tetrahedron, ideal tetrahedra, then this is the ideal triangulation of a graph complement three manifold. But it's triangulation, but I, I want to. Uh, give you, just to uh, cl cl clarify that an ideal triangulation is not the same as triangulation. So, because first, first of all, when we talk about a triangulation, uh, usually we talk about triangulation of uh, four manifold if we study 4D quantum gravity. And the ideal triangulation, we usually consider it for a, a three manifold with a boundary. So its boundary is not an empty set. And also, it's also not uh, the same as the triangulation of a uh, three manifold. This is an, it's a very different uh, construction, just to clarify that. So don't try to connect it with a triangulation. Now, in our example, uh, we, have, we want to do the ideal triangulation of our three manifold, which is the gamma five graph complement of a three sphere. And it's hard to tell you all how, how to get the result, but let me just tell you the result. The ideal triangulation of this three manifold is a collection of a uh, collection of several ideal tetrahedron, ideal tetrahedra, and the result is that it can be decomposed into twenty ideal tetrahedra. And uh, to see the whole picture, I will just refer you to the uh, figure four in the lecture note I provided. And just to give you one hint, 
which is that the boundary of this ideal tetrahedra, which is the, this cusp boundary, they are located on the annuli. All the cusp boundaries are on the annuli of the uh, graph complement, the gamma phi graph complement, complement of the three sphere. And if you, so for now, I just want you to accept this fact. The ideal triangulation of this three manifold gives you 20 ideal tetrahedra, okay? And recall that, what, is our, what was our goal for this task one? Our goal is to, con to construct the transcendence partition function on the uh, gamma five graph complement of three sphere. And why do we do this ideal triangulation? It's because the uh, partition function on uh, the ideal tetrahedron is known. Then to construct the partition function for the whole three manifold, then it will um, basically becomes a product of 20 uh, partition function, each one, each on one ideal tetrahedron, and upon some uh, constraint imposed. So we have several constraints, and that's it. So it's very simple. And so our first, our task 1.1 is to construct this partition function for on a ideal tetrahedron. So let's do that. I, so the main thing in this lecture is to explain how we construct it. So we start from classical setting. First, we, cons we consider the transcendence phase space for the boundary of an ideal tetrahedron. So the, uh, so first consider a general two manifold. I would denote by sigma. And the phase space of transcendence phase space on a two manifold is uh, so the phase space of transcendence theory um, whose gauge group is a, say G on this two manifold is defined as the flat, uh, modulized space of flat connection. So uh, modulized space of G value flat, flat connection uh, on, the, on this two manifold. And it's defined as the flat Lie algebra G value connection on this two manifold quotient by uh, the G action. And this is, uh, I, this is proved that it's uh, isomorphic to the homomorphism uh, of a fundamental group of this two manifold to the G group quotient by the G. And this basically that you can understand this, hom this uh, homomorphic as the holonomy which is a representation of the fundamental group. And this quotient is by the quotient out of the gauge. Let me give you an example, which is actually a very important example. We will use it tomorrow. And the example is uh, considered a two manifold to be a full sphere. Now I have a two sphere and remove four points, I have four holes. And the fundamental group is generated by four loops uh, located uh, starting and ending at the same point. Say so this point, I have one, two, three, four, each surrounding a, sorry, each surrounding a, a, a hole. And I've called it L1, L2, L3, L4. And the fundamental group is the, generated by these loops and they should satisfy the, uh, the condition that combining all these loops together, it gives me one. And here, this Li, they are in the fundamental group of the full sphere. And this homomorphism is just to write the holonomy, uh, holonomies that are um, along this loop and this holonomy takes the value in the G group. And this condition can be written as a closure condition. So H4, H3, H2, H1 equals to identity in the group G. And this uh, quotient is uh, by gauge. So we know that, uh, so the gauge is uh, HI goes to G, HIG inverse 
for any G in this gauge group. And this is nothing but changing the base point. Here, the base point to define all the H. If I change the gauge, uh, the, the base point to another point, that is the gauge transformation. Okay, now this is the, just an example to explain uh, what is the modularized phase of flat connection. Now, our two, two manifold is the boundary of the th or three sphere. Then the modularized space is the modularized space of G value, um, flat connection on the boundary of a three manifold. I would denote it by P partial M3, uh, partial, sorry, partial M, M3. And uh, let me also tell you that this manifold, in general, it's a Poisson manifold. And the boundary of a three, sphere, uh, of a three manifold is a closed manifold, and this becomes a symplectic manifold. So it has symplectic structure. And on this phase space, uh, because we study the transition theory on the three manifold, and that the boundary is so the the, the, the flat connect, the flat connection means that the curvature of the connection is flat, but that the boundary of a three manifold is flat doesn't mean that the bulk is also flat. And if I require the bulk is uh, flat on this three manifold, then I will get a sub manifold of this phase space of this uh, symplectic manifold. And uh, this is called this is a, actually a Lagrangian sub manifold. I will denote it by L M three. And it is a Lagrangian submanifold. Of this uh, symplectic space or phase space of transition theory on the boundary of a uh, three sphere. Uh, what is a Lagrangian submanifold? Let me give you the definition first. Uh, a Lagrangian submanifold, say L of a symplectic manifold which uh, I call M. It's a symplectic manifold, so it also has symplectic structure. It's such that, so it's a submanifold of this uh, symplectic manifold such that uh, the symplectic form, uh, if I restrict it to this submanifold, it gives us zero. And also, the dimension of this submanifold equals to one half of the original symplectic, of the, uh, one half of the dimension of the original symplectic manifold. And this is not, thing, not something that is very new. We actually have a very easy example of it. An example is uh, I consider M is R2, and the symplectic form is dp dx. And then I define our symplectic submanifold to be L equals to, like I let, the L is constructed by let P equal to zero. Then the L itself is isomorphic to just a real line. This, we, we do it all the time. It's nothing but to choose X as the polarization. And then we do the canonical uh, quantization. Then we construct some wave function of, which is a function of the position X. And then the P becomes a derivative um, operator. So we've seen that this, and now um, the Lagrange, Lagrangian submanifold we are interested in just a generalization of this concept. Okay, now this is uh, just to give you some general definition. Now our case. So I, our group is SL2C. Our three manifold is uh, an ideal tetrahedron. Then its boundary is the, just a boundary of an ideal, ideal tetrahedron. And this allows us to construct the transition phase space on the boundary and the Lagrangian submanifold. Okay, great. We have the uh, phase space for transition theory on the on the boundary of a uh, ideal uh, ideal tetrahedron, and it's not 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 enough. We also want to add some one more ingredient. So we add a so-called framing flag. Framing flag. I denote it by S to each cusp boundary of the ideal tetrahedron. I remind you what is the cusp boundary. Let me just copy 
this ideal tetrahedron to here. And the cusp boundary are the truncated triangle. I color in gray here. And what is the framing flag? Now it's a multi-line space of flat SL2C connection. So I can construct holonomy, SL2C holonomy. So now I construct a, oh, around each, each cusp boundary, I can construct a holonomy around the cusp, uh, the cusp boundary, which, is in, which takes a value of SL2C. And with, for this holonomy, I can construct what is the eigenvalue, what is the eigenvector. So the eigenvalue, eigenvector satisfy this uh, equation. And the framing flag is defined as the eigen, eigenvector of this holonomy around the cusp boundary. But up to a complex scaling. So this S takes a value in CP1, okay? And why do we want to introduce this framing flag? I think I see a question. Going back to um, choosing the Lagrangian submanifold, yeah. uh, I get that choosing P equals zero gives us that, um, uh, and then you know choosing X for polarization gives us that your uh, momentum operator now becomes our uh, partial uh, of X, but um, can you motivate that from like maybe a physical or more intuitive uh, standpoint? Choose, can you motivate choosing P equals zero? Yes, that's another polarization. And I'm just giving you an example of what is Lagrangian submanifold that you see in, in, the, uh, in classical mechanics. Now I'm just, gen I generalize this, this uh, idea and now I'm not considering polarization. Yeah, it's a generalization concept. Just Lagrangian submanifold as, as it defined. It is the symplectic form equals zero. The dimension is half of the original symplectic manifold. Okay. So why do we introduce a framing flag? Before that, I see another question. Yes. So, I, so can can you go back? Let, let me just make sure. So, so the point is like this: P partial M three is the phase space of the flat connection, right? Right. So it is a symplectic manifold. And then, what is this Lagrangian manner? Lagrangian sum manifold of P partial M3, it is the, the manifold of the solution with F equals to zero? Yeah. Okay. In, in the bulk, yes. Yeah. And I will write you why I will have, uh, how do I realize that F equals zero uh, soon? So, Okay, why, why do we want to introduce a framing flag? It's because it allows us to write a, it allows us to introduce a, define a very convenient uh, coordinate of this space, space, space. And this coordinate is called a full control coordinate. I will call it FG coordinate. Then this coordinate is for the phase space, transcendence phase space on the boundary of a, an ideal triangulation, uh, ideal tetrahedron. And why is it good? Because this, co this coordinate is that it has two nice properties. The first one is that it's gauge invariant. And the second, it has a simple Poisson bracket. Okay, how do we define this using the framing flag? It's the following. So because, and, and these coordinates are associated on the edges of the, of the uh, geodesic boundary, for example, this edge here. And we know that each edge in, on the boundary of the ideal tetrahedron can be viewed as a diagonal of a uh, quadrilateral. For example, I have the quadrilateral like this. And here is the diagonal. Of course, this, all the vertices, they are truncated vertices. So I should put a gray triangle here. And this can, and the FG coordinate is associated to oh, this diagonal edges. I call it X of E, say this edge is E. And how do we do that? First, because we introduce a framing flag to each cusp boundary, say S1, I'll put a prime, S2 prime, S4 prime, S3 prime. 
First thing to do is to parallel transport them to a common point. I would define the SI equals to HI, which is the holonomy, SI prime for I equals to one to four because I have four uh, cusp boundary. And let's, let's choose a point inside this uh, quadrilateral, parallel, uh, yeah, quadrilateral, and I parallel S1 prime using H1, parallel transport S2 prime using H2, and then H3, H4. And then I define a S1, S2, S3, S4. Then I can now, using these parallel transported spring flag, I define the FG coordinate in this way as a cross ratio, which is S1, S2, S3, S4 over, in the denominator, I exchange S3 and S2. And what is this uh, inner product? Because the framing flag is an eigenvector of the holonomy in the fundamental representation, I can write it as a two components, S0, S1, which is in, as I said, I told you it's in CP1, so it's also in a subset of uh, two, it's represented by two complex number, complex variable, and this inner product for xi, xj is defined as s0, si0, sj1 minus si1, sj0. Then you immediately realize that si cross s, this is anti-symmetric. And this inner product has a nice property, it's gauge invariant. So SI, which SJ, is equals to I paratransported SI with G and paratransport SJ also with G. Then they are the same for any G in SL2C. So if I use this inner product to define a, a, in, define a coordinate, of course it's gauge invariant. So we see the first nice property. And second, wh why is, what is a simple Poisson bracket? So I first, I take the logarithmic of this coordinate, I denote it as uh, e to the chi e, then this chi e has very simple Poisson bracket. Suppose I have chi, e and e prime associated to different edges, then it has three possible, possible uh, result. First is equal to one, if e is on the left of e prime, of course the vertex is also the cusp boundary, and it equals to minus one if it's the opposite. And equals to zero if this E and E prime, they are not connected to the same uh, cusp boundary. It's very simple. So we see the nice property of this kind of uh, coordinate. Now, how many coordinates do you have on a boundary of an ideal, ideal uh, tetragon? Now, on ideal tetragon, on the boundary of an ideal uh, tetrahedron, I have six edges. I told you that the edge, the, these coordinates are associate, uh, associated on the edges of the boundary of the, an ideal tetrahedron. But because it's a flat, it's a modular light space of flat connection, so we require the eigenvalue for the holonomy around each cusp has to be trivial. So I have lambda equals to one for all the cusp boundary, I have four of them. So you immediately realize that the dimension of the, this phase space has to be two. Question? Um, I, uh, I got a little lost when you, so you labeled the geodesic boundary chi E. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and, and, and so, so this inner product that you give um, by introducing the flags, it will be a number, so should I think of chi e as perhaps the length of the geodesic uh, boundary? No, it's, it's not a number, it's a variable. It's actually a function of the connection, which I, I will just tell you in a minute. Okay, thank you. So we immediately know that the dimension is two. So, so, so what is this as prime? S prime, oh, it just, it's a framing flag I introduced at the cusp boundary. It's, uh, it's the eigenvector of the holonomy around that cusp boundary. Uh, so this is the reason, so, so, so could I understand like this x prime because it is the eigenvalue. Or eigenvector. Eigen, eigenvector, so it characterizes the holonomy at each. Yes, 
and the holonomy is the phase space. Holonomy, uh, it's a function of the phase space variable. So that means like this S prime is like the coordinate of the phase space. It's a function of the coordinate, it's a function on the phase space. Okay, okay. Okay, so two dimension, so we have, we can find two a FG coordinates. I would denote them, so, okay, the kinematical phase space, and it's spanned by two coordinates, I would denote it by Z and Z prime, Z double prime, and uh, they are located on the edges, let me also copy paste, let me copy paste again. They are associated to the edges. I would say this is E, and this is E double prime. And you will realize that on the opposite edge, they are associated to the same FG coordinate just by direct calculation using the framing flag. And I also introduce a redundant uh, coordinate, I call it Z prime, on the remaining two edges. And then I, the, I can, using the uh, Z and Z double prime, I can write, you, because they are phase wave coordinates, I can use them to write out a symplectic form. And the symplectic form is dz double prime over the z double prime, which dz over dz. And this is the, actually only the holomorphic, uh, holo, holo, holomorphic part, and we also have the anti-holomorphic part. And it's spanned by z bar, just take the complex conjugate of them, and I can also write the symplectic form using the Z bar double prime and Z bar. Sorry, this is Z, Z bar. And because we know that holonomy is a, is a the phase space is a phase space of flat connection. The connection, the holonomy is a function of connection. Then if I solve the eigenvector, which is a framing flag, the framing flag also is a function of the connection. Then I use this framing flag to construct the coordinates, which is z and z, uh, z double prime. So this z and z double prime, they are also a function of the connection. So these uh, symplectic form, they're just uh, re uh, represent of the symplectic form that I of Chen Simon's theory I introduced in the first lecture. So it's, it's uh, related to this symplectic form. Okay. Um, here, I, okay, I, here I have z double prime, I said it's redundant because it's a function of z and z double prime. More precisely, it goes to minus one z and z double prime. Okay, so it's redundant. Now, if I combine the holomorphic and holomorphic part, then the symplectic form of the Chen Simon theory, now I put the uh, complex coupling constant here, then it becomes t over four pi omega plus t bar over four pi omega bar, bar. And here again, this t and t bar, they are complex coupling constant. Now we have the phase space of the, uh, on the boundary of the ideal triangulation, or uh, ideal tetrahedron. Then if I require the bulk of the ideal tetrahedron to be flat, then I can also construct the Lagrangian uh, submanifold for the ideal tetrahedron. How do we construct it? We construct it by requiring that it's flat in the bulk, which means that the holonomy, if I construct, if I construct the holonomy, it must be identity, that then it will be a flat. How do I construct holonomy? We see from here that uh, holonomy is a function of connection and the coordinates are also a function of connection. So you can get an idea that we must be able to construct the holonomy out of this uh, coordinates, here's double prime. Why do I put double prime here? Okay, so this is, there's a system, uh, there's a rigorous way to do that, and this is called the snake rule. But I'm not going to tell you all the details of snake rule. You can refer to the equation 40, equation 40 in, uh, in the lecture note. I think it's on page 11, if I remember correctly. But I'll just tell you the result. The result is that uh, this result is on the boundary of an uh, ideal tetrahedron. And the holonomy in the fundamental resolution is uh, equals to one 
the diagonal is one one because uh, the eigenvalue is one already, and the off diagonal lower triangular element is one over z double prime times z double prime plus z inverse minus one, and this uh, uh, upper triangular element is zero. This is in SL two C. If I require this to be one, that just means that this must be zero. So the Lagrange is a manifold. I can write it using the coordinate, the FG coordinate. It is defined as the coordinate, which is uh, Z, Z, Z double prime. I also have the uh, complex conjugate uh, part of it, such that it satisfies the Z double prime plus Z minus, Z inverse minus one equals zero. Also, I have the complex conjugate part. Bar minus one equals to zero. And this is the Lagrange, Lagrangian submanifold using the coordinate of the phase space. Okay, now we have the phase space, we have the Lagrangian submanifold, we can quantize it just using the canonical quantization. But wait a minute, we don't know how to quantize it. We don't know, we're not, we're not quite familiar with how to quantize it. What we are really familiar with is something like this in quantum mechanics. So if in quantum mechanics, if you give me a uh, symplectic form, which is uh, some real constant, and I, I have some coordinate with TPI wedge TQI, where this is a constant is a real, it's a constant, then I, don't, I know how to quantize it. How to quantize it? I just quantize the Q to a multiplication operator, Q hat, and the P is quantized to a uh, derivative, uh, derivative operator. So h bar c partial q i. Then I know how to quantize it. But here, this is our symplectic form, which is uh, we have d z double prime over z double prime wedge d z over z. So it's not in the same it's not in the same form as what we are familiar with in quantum mechanics. So how to do that? We do that by doing a reparameterization of the coordinate. So what we do is to parameterize this z and z double prime. So we write it as a function of two parameters. One is a mu, one is m, and it's defined as exponential of two pi i over k, and then minus b mu minus m. And the z double prime is also a function of two parameters, which is nu and n, another two parameter, but in the same form. So two pi i over k and minus i b, I will tell you what is b uh, in this form. What is b? This b is a function of the barbaric immersive parameter in this way. b squared equals to one minus i gamma over one plus i gamma. And you realize that you can calculate, you realize the real part of the b is larger than zero and the imaginary part of B is non-zero. You also realize that the B, if I take the complex conjugate, it gives me B inverse, which means that B is just a phase factor. It must be able to written, be written in this way. Okay, this is a parameterization of Z. I can do the same thing for Z bar, just to do the complex conjugate of it. Then you realize that I just should change uh, no, Z bar change b to b inverse, because b bar equals b inverse, and then change minus m to plus m. And here is the same thing. Now, what, uh, which space does this parameter mu, mu, nu, mn take? This mu and nu, they are real number. Uh, they are real variable. And m and n, they are discrete variable, and they take uh, integer up to mod, modulo k which means that this M and N, they can be taken, they, if I choose the, the, the branch well, then it takes value from zero, one, two, up to K minus one. Where K, I take it to be a, indie, a positive integer, just for simplicity. So already from here, you already get a sense uh, that the, we will get some truncation for this uh, discrete variable, and this is, uh, this will lead us to the final amplitude in the end, which we will see tomorrow. Okay, and 
Now I can rewrite using this new parameter. I rewrite this symplectic form for the Chen Simons theory, which gives us 2 pi over k, and then d nu, which d mu, minus dn, which dm, where from which I can derive the Poisson bracket of, uh, of the new parameter, mu nu equals to Poisson bracket of nm equals to k over 2 pi. Now we're happy because this is the form that we are familiar with in quantum mechanics. So we can know how to quantize it. Let's quantize it. So the next thing to do is to do the quantization of the Chen-Simons theory on an ideal tetrahedron. So to, to quantize it, we introduce a quantum parameter. Which I denote by Q. It's, or, it's, excuse me. Yes. So, so question here. So here you see this M and N. They are just like 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 uh, integer. Yes. And then how do you define this dn which dm? The dm which dm. Uh, yes. Oh, we because get it. because if M N they are integer, so you it is not like R four R four. Yes, R four. And then how do you have this dn which dm? Uh, no, we, we just derive directly from here. I just write it in, well, I express the z and z double prime in terms of mu m and a new n. Then I just get the result. So, so that means like this m and they are also real number, right? Uh, no, they are discrete number. Or you can do, think of this d as a jump. But I have the yeah dn over, over k. That you can take the k large, then it's more like continuous, but it's discrete. Okay, let's quantize it. We quantize it uh, first by introducing quantum parameter q, which is exponential of another parameter h, and q to another pra quantum parameter, or <coughs> exponential e to the h tilt. Uh, and this h <coughs> is uh, is a function of the complex complex uh, co coupling constant it's equals to four pi i over t, or it's equals to two pi over k, one plus b squared. And this h tilt is just to replace the t by t bar, and or another way is to replace the b. <coughs> by b inverse, so b minus two. And first thing first, why is it called quantum parameter? Because we know that the, the k, if you remember, it equals to 12 pi over uh, gamma Planck length squared, absolute lambda, absolute lambda. We know at the, at the, uh, the quantum parameter is the Planck length, which is a function of the h bar, the, the Planck constant. And when this goes to and, and we know that this now then h and h, h two they are also function of the k then it's also a function of h bar that's why we, they they, are, they can be viewed as a quantum parameter and if I take the uh, the scale which is la much larger than the Planck length where or we are take the Planck length to zero then this is the classical limit and this classical limit can be also represented by taking the k to a very large or equivalently the h goes to uh, goes to a very small number or the q and q2 they are very close to one and this is a classical classical limit of this quantum parameter now we can just do a, as in usual canonical quantization we quantize the Poisson bracket which is the Poisson bracket of the coordinate mu nu m and here to a uh, to a, a commutator of operator, which I put a hat here for the quantization, and this gives us k over two pi i. This is the commutator of the uh, quantum op operator after we do the quantization. And also, I at a at classical level we have the kinematical phase space, 
which is P partial uh, ideal tetrahedron. And this is quantized to the kinematical Hilbert space. What he was he was basically be, I would denote it by H kinematical because we have the continuous parameter mu and a discrete parameter m. So uh, very naturally, it will, the the kinematical Hilbert space is the uh, square integrable function on a real number, and and v four or this uh, v k. This is just a k dimensional complex uh, plane because we have the discrete variable m from k, which can take the value from zero to k minus one. And this is because we have a parameter mu here. And also this Hilbert space has an inner product. We just define the inner product to, for any function f or g, which is, of, is defined as the integral for the parameter mu and the sum for the m, which takes a value in z mod k and for any fun function, which is a function of mu and m now, and another function g of m, mu and m. This, and they are function in the kinematical Hilbert space. And this is the inner product associated to this Hilbert space. And also, we quantize the uh, operator to multiplication operator and derivative operator that we are very familiar with. So this mu hat, they act on a function in the Hilbert space as a multiplication operator. Then the new hat, which is the uh, complex, uh, it's a uh, conjugate momentum of the mu, it will just quantize, it's just quantized to the derivative operator. So it's equals to minus k over two pi i partial mu of this function in this Hilbert space. And mu and m, we, uh, mu, m and n are similar, but they're discrete, so we, Instead of writing as the derivative operator, we'll write as a, a shift operator. So we'll write in a slightly different way. For the mu, for the m, two pi o, two e to the two pi i over k, m hat, it acts on the function of the Hilbert space as a multiplication operator. And the n hat acts on the same function by shifting this m by one. So that's how they, uh, how, they oper uh, how they act on functions of Hilbert space. Then I can also construct this uh, z before we do the parameterization. Then it's the operator of it just to put a hat on its parameter we see in the classical and z double prime hat is equal to exponential two pi i over k minus b i b new hat minus n hat. So using this, you can also write that how they act on a function. And z act on a function, which is a function of mu and m, or I can write it as a function of z and z bar. They are uh, just the same, the same thing. And this is a multiplication operator again, and the z, uh, double prime hat, it acts on this function by multiplying the variable z uh, by a, with a q. And for the z bar part, I also, def the, the operator is also a um, multiplication operator. And the z bar double prime, it multiplies the variable z bar by q tilde. So it's a very simple, uh, simple operation on the function of the, uh, of the Hilbert space, kinematical Hilbert space. Now, also, we, uh, classical level, we have the Lagrangian submanifold. And that, this can be also quantized because the Lagrangian submanifold is de described by restricting the coordinate to satisfy a constraint. This constraint, after quantization, they become a constraint operator. So this is quantized to a distribution that satisfies the following operator. This operator is nothing but a z double prime hat plus z minus one hat minus one. 
and it acts on a function in, uh, which is a function of z, z bar equals zero. And we also have the bar version of it. Then we'll just try to solve it. And the solution is given by the, it's called the quantum dilogarithm function. And it's written in the following way. So I denote it by psi triangle, which is a function of mu m, as usual. And it, it includes an infinite product from j equals to zero to infinity, and one minus q tilde to j plus one power, and z bar inverse over one minus q to the minus j, and z inverse. And, um, First thing first, why is it called quantum dilogarithm function? It's because if we take the classical limit, which is q, q tilde equal goes to one, then you realize that this uh, function, it can be expressed in terms of the dilogarithm function in the following way. It equals to approach to the, oh, let me just write equal, minus i k over two pi one plus b squared and the dilogarithm function of z inverse minus i k over two pi one plus b inverse uh, minus two, and dilogarithm function of z bar inverse. And then this is the leading order. I will also have some subleading order. Okay, and this dilogarithm function uh, is defined as an infinite sum n from one to infinity to z to n over n squared. And this is defined for a z whose norm is less than one. And if you're still not familiar with what is dilogarithm function, you must know what is logarithm function. A logarithm function is if I do the Taylor expansion around one, then I get uh, one minus z, it's equals to n equals to one to infinity sum, and z n to n. And this again, for z whose norm is less than one. Then now you see, I just, uh, as it, this is just an analog of the logarithm function by changing this n to n squared in, uh, in, in the power, in the denominator. That's why it's called the logarithm function. And the quantum because we recovered the logarithm function in the classical limit, so we call this function the quantum logarithm function. Okay, so in literature, we, it's found that this quantum dilogarithm function, it can be interpreted as some sig j symbol. And this sig j symbol is not the one that, of SU2 that many people could be familiar with, but it's a sig j symbol of uh, Y algebra. And this is related to the uh, Borel subalgebra the representation of the Borel subalgebra of UQSL2C. And here, the UQSL2C is a quantum group. And this is, is discovered by the Kashayev in 1994. So, so there's some similarity, although it's not the sex trait symbol that we're familiar with, there's some similarity with the sex trait symbol of SU2. Of SU2. First, it's, a, so it's the quantum state of an ideal tetrahedron, and the sixth trait symbol of SU2 is the quantum state for a tetrahedron. This is the first similarity. And second similarity, if you're familiar with the sixth trait symbol and how to derive it, you know that it is derived by a recursion relation. And this quantum dilogarithm function is also, can also be derived using, uh, from a recursion relation. And this is just uh, what we wrote here, because I've told you that z a double hat act on the function, it just multiply the variable in the function by q. And because of the, this equation, I know that it must be equals to one minus z to the inverse times the function. And we also have the bar version of it and it multiply the variable 
Z-bar by q tilde And this gives us another recursion relation. And using this recursion relation, you can actually derive what we got here. So there's a, this is another similarity. Great. Now we get the uh, quantum di logarithm function for an ideal tetrahedron. And this is nothing but uh, this function of mu m. This is nothing but the partition function of an ideal tetrahedron. And I, as I told you at, at the end of last at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of last lecture, using this partition function, I can eventually construct the partition function of the gamma five complement of a three sphere, which will lead us to the sim, uh, to the sim thing for model of four D quantum gravity with a non-zero lambda. Okay, so now we have our building block. Since it's so important, let me also tell you some property of this quantum dialogarithm function. So first. Uh, this function, it has a singularity at mu z equal to zero, which is bad, because if I do the integration over this function, it might give us some divergence. So how do we do that? The, the way to solve this problem is to do the analytic continuation. So we perform the analytic continuation of the, of the variable mu. So I let it uh, to take the value in complex variable. Then its complex, uh, its conjugate momentum, nu, must also take a complex variable. Then if I do an integration of the, of the uh, quantum directory function, then I can, in, in, if d mu, instead of integrating over a real line, I can shift it by introducing an um, imaginary part. Then now, it's the, this, this function, which is a function of mu m, it's now a function of a complex variable mu. And this turns out to be a meromorphic function. Of the variable m, mu. And in particular, it turns out to be holom holomorphic in the uh, upper plane of the mu. So that when the imaginary mu is positive, and it has poles only in the half, uh, in the on, on the real line and in the low half plane. And if I draw the location of where the poles are, then I have uh, axis real mu, imaginary mu, and the poles are uh, at the origin, and then this is how the poles are located. It's like this pattern, and go on. So this means that I can just shift the integration of contour, contour if I want to do the integration over this function, by um, instead of, here's the real line, instead of integrating along the real line, I can shift it above. Say this is the distance is alpha, and this becomes a new integration of contour. And actually, I introduce the imaginary part. I just fix the imaginary part, and I call the imaginary part of mu equals to alpha. Imaginary part of nu equals to uh, it's a beta. I denote it in this way. And as long as I can make sure that this imaginary part they satisfy some con constraint con condition, I call it p. This is called the positive angle structure. And, and this positive angle structure, just uh, structure, so to lead us to a convergent result after we do the integration. I don't have time to, do, to dig into detail, so I will just refer you to the lecture note from in page 14 to 15, if you're interested. Okay, and that's it. And so I just tell, I'm just telling you the property of it. How much time do I have left? Four minutes. Four minutes. Then let's do a four minutes exercise. So let's do an exercise. Now I have 20 ideal tetrahedron. Ideal tetrahedron. I want to glue them together to form the boundary of the gamma five graph complement of a three sphere. And 
Let's first glue four ideal tetrahedra together, and they will form a octahedron. And I was very clever to secretly store this here, so so that I don't need to draw again, and then make it bigger, bigger. <laughs> this is an ideal uh, octahedron. I glued four ideal tetrahedra together. And here, one of them is this. Here's the cusp boundary, and another cusp boundary, another cusp boundary, another cusp boundary on the, on the bottom. And I have six edges, one, two, three, four, and one that's already in red. This is one ideal tetrahedron, and I glue four of them in together in this way. And now, uh, then, um, and this is called the ideal octahedron. I denote it by oct. And because now you see that this link, this edge is in the bulk of the ideal octahedron, and because we are working on a flat connection of a three manifold, so it must be flat in the bulk. So this means that there must be some constraint associate to this link. And eventually, if I associate the um, coordinate, if I say this is x and y, z, w, because I have four ideal tetrahedron, and this, the opposite edge is also associated with x, y, z, w. And the uh, mechanism of it is just to product them together. Then either my gluing constraint turns out to be x, y, z, w equals to one. And I will also have the uh, bar, the bar version, the complex conjugate version of it. But since I uh, analytic continue the mu to be a complex number, so the z bar, if I define in the same way as before, it's, not, it's no longer the complex conjugate of z. So I would call them, uh, instead of z bar, I would call it z tilt, also for the x, y, and w. And this is another constraint. This is a gluing constraint. Then. Um, then the phase space of this, of the boundary of the ideal octahedron, it, be, it becomes a product, the direct product of four uh, phase space of ideal tetrahedron, ideal tetrahedra, product them together, but quotient, double quotient by the constraint C and C tilt here. So it's actually smaller. Then if I take the exponent, um, the logarithm of these coordinates, S equals to X E uh, to capital X, Y E equals to E to the capital Y, and so on. Then I, my coordinate of the ideal octahedron to becomes it was originally um, so. So this constraint allows us to write uh, the W as a function of X Y Z. So I so the dimension of this phase space is. Um, is a six because its dimension of this equals to two times four and then minus two. Uh, minus two because I have two constraints. Then it becomes six. Then the, the logarithmic coordinate, I would denote it by x, y, and z. And the uh, conjugate momentum, I denote it by x, x, uh, px, py, and Pz, and you can also write out what is the symplectic form, and then you can write out uh, what is the Poisson bracket of it. And I think more details you can find it in the lecture note. But I will tell you why I introduce it because we use it. This also the this structure appears in the in the ideal triangulation of the three manifold that we are interested in, and this I uh, can gives us the partition function of the ideal octahedron, which is a function of x, y, z, and p, x, p, y, p, z. And it's just a, a product of the um, ideal of the partition of the quantum dialogarithm function, which is function z, z, tilt, and then y, y, tilt, and then I will have function of w, which is a function of x, y, z now, and um, 
a function of x, y, z, and p, x, y, p, z, actually. And then w2 is also a function of them. And this is the partition function of an ideal octahedron. And we will continue tomorrow.